I'm Inspector Joanna Bevan, Desjardins. I'm the unit commander of the Toronto Police Service Sex Crimes Unit. Over the past several days, there has been extensive media coverage relating to allegations of assault and sexual assault. Welcome back to the Gian Gomeshi Hysteria. Fear not, this video is not going to analyze the Gian Gomeshi story details per se. Uh, the purpose is to analyze how the Toronto Police and the media partner together to perform investigations that are one-sided and biased. Um, the video is going to analyze a conference that was held the day after his invest the investigation into allegations made against him was opened. The conference was held by the Toronto Sex Crimes Unit Commander Joanna Bevan Desjardins. In this conference she makes some very revealing and concerning statements that make it painfully clear how they do not conduct proper investigations and I analyze that and I will proceed to use statistics, um, other case examples and whatnot to highlight how this is not just um, a uh, perspective of mine but it's actually how they operate and I'm just trying to bring more light to it because it's uh, something we should all be concerned about and something that we need to speak out against. It needs to come to an end. Proper investigations need to be conducted for the sake of the accused. So if you would like to pause this video right here to brush up on the background of the hysteria that played out in the media, first it played out in blogs, then it played out in major media publications, and then it became a police investigation. So a, quite a lot of media hysteria um, started his case, which obviously is not typical for most sexual assault cases. But nonetheless, it is important um, because of the, the high profile of his case, um, we are allowed to look at how the police actually conduct investigations because of the conference she held. So let's continue on with the video. Over the past several days, there has been extensive media coverage relating to allegations of assault and sexual assault. When I became aware of this information, I assigned investigators immediately to review all media coverage relating to this investigation. Really? You assign investigators to read online publications? You assign investigators to read stories published online? Stories of people telling stories. <laughs> this is what you assign your investigators to do in order to try and crack a case open for criminal prosecution. Really? On Thursday, October 30th, Goodness. when we became aware that allegedly nine victims had contacted various media sources to report incidents of assault and sexual assault, I assigned investigators to contact these media outlets to provide contact information of the team leader assigned to the review. We requested these media outlets to pass this information on to the persons they were speaking to, um, speaking with, to inform them of the availability of victim services. So victims report incidents of sexual assault to the media. This is to be taken seriously as the media is now a subsidiary of the police force? You you realize what you're saying here is that victims telling stories to publishers equals victims reporting incidents of sexual assault. Not only that, but then you say that you reached out to the publishers to contact these so-called victims and ask them to come forward to the police. Is that not... Um, contradictory to the police's policy, the police force's policy of not reaching out to victims, but victims must come to the police to report. Essentially, by asking publishers to ask these people to come to the police is pretty much the same as the police reaching out to these people and saying, hey, I hear you have experienced incidents of sexual assault. Well, we're the police, and if you come to us and report to us, we can help you. 
So come to us, please, because, well, that's what we want you to do. As of today's date, three people have contacted us, providing us information that they have been victimized relating to these allegations. The Toronto Police Service Sex Crimes has now commenced an active investigation into these allegations. Through a statement released to the media, we became aware that persons or persons have viewed graphic evidence of physical injury to a woman. As a result, we are requesting the public to come forward with any video, photograph, social media chats relating to this investigation to contact sex crimes immediately. Congratulations, you got your victims, three of them. And not only that, but one of them claims that they saw graphic evidence of physical injury to a woman. But uh, apparently you don't have this evidence. It is possible further victims may reside outside of Ontario. If that is the case, please contact Toronto Police Services Sex Crimes to report any information and we will coordinate the investigation with our law enforcement partners in that jurisdiction. Yes, we have victims, but we want more victims. Even though there is no evidence proving that they are victims, we will telegraph our intentions looking for these victims across the nation to come forward and tell us about their victimhood story. Yes, because even though you haven't proven that you're a victim, we know you're a victim based on what we've read in the media. We are grateful that one of our media partners have engaged in counseling for their employees. Media partner? The Toronto Police refers to CBC as a media partner. Do they consider all journalists as media partners? I'm confused because <clears throat> aren't journalists supposed to be learning how to be skeptical and discerning in their reportage on public affairs? because I sure haven't seen that in any reports that have come out about this case, about Gian Gomeshi. Nobody has ever taken a fair and balanced approach, considering he's innocent until proven guilty. No, he's been made guilty in the media sphere, in the public sphere. He's already been convicted in the court of the public, and the police partner with that. They act accordingly, that if somebody comes forward to the media and says that they are a victim, that means they are a victim and the Toronto police would like to manage their victimhood. However, we believe that not all potential victims are employed by the same media outlet. While we encourage all affected individuals to come forward and report to police, we want to make sure that everyone has access to support services regardless of their decision to report. We, the Toronto Police Service, works with an independent charitable organization, Victim Services Toronto. So even though none of these women have been proven to be victims, they are treated as victims immediately. Of course, in the case if a woman was legitimately just raped and needed help, needed assistance, these services um, are well placed for, the, for that purpose. But when someone comes forward and, and says, you know, 10, 15 years ago, I went out on a date with a guy and, well, he was a little rough with me, you know, looking back at it now, I think I would call it rape or sexual assault. And I think that's a criminal charge. Therefore, I was criminally injured. So what that means is that as soon as this woman comes forward to claim this, she is immediately eligible for criminal injury compensation paid for by the public purse. She does not have to prove her victimhood in order to be eligible. The man doesn't have to be charged or convicted in order for her to be able to receive such compensation. She also receives free counseling, free legal services. Anything she needs, it is handed to her and paid for by the public purse, even without proof that a crime actually happened. The Toronto Police Service is committed to investigating this matter fully, as we would any other matter involving this type of inve investigation. This type of investigation, where you've already tarnished the case with your bias by believing the women that come forward with their complaints are actual victims, believing that they are victims of, of a crime that has happened, You've already tarnished the case. There is, there is tunnel vision 
as soon as you believe this person's story as truth. How can you fully investigate this type of investigation when you've already started off with such a bias? We are appealing to the public for assistance in this matter. I am encouraging any further victims to contact us, Toronto Police Sex Crimes, at 416-808-7474. I am also requesting anyone with any information relating to this investigation to also contact us at this number or at Crime Stoppers at 222-TIPS or our main Toronto Police number at 416-808-2222. Thank you. With telegraphing intent, as you just did, you do realize that this creates an influence opportunity with anybody who does contact you either to claim that they are also a victim or to claim that they have evidence for you that you should see related to this case. In an example of telegraphing intentions that was condemned recently by Justice Wedge in the Robinson versus Furlong verdict released September 18th, just last month, um, she describes how journalism is not any different than social work or police officer when it comes to investigating. All investigations should be held to the same standard and when, uh, when any of those people telegraph intentions prior to an interview, uh, it leaves it open to influence. The answers that will be given in the interview can be influenced and uh, it, it, it doesn't help in the search for truth, which is the sole purpose of an investigation. The search for truth, the investigation, the completely impartial and unbiased investigation should be conducted prior before it ever reaches a courtroom. And I will read the excerpts. So first, um, the journalist would obtain better information from an interview if she or he did not telegraph the reason for the interview because telegraphing intent could otherwise influence the answers given in the interview. Whether the investigator is a journalist, a social worker, or a police officer, the object is to obtain the truth. Whatever the investigator's professional credentials, he or she must be up to the task of determining, to the greatest extent possible, the accuracy of the information where guilt or innocence, or the reputation of an individual, is at stake. The greatest of care should have been taken to ensure that the stories were completely spontaneous and not influenced in any way by the interviewer. So here in this particular uh, conference, we are being told that the investigation is not being conducted properly. We're, we're not being told this directly, but we are, we are being fed the propaganda that the police do not need to conduct two-sided investigations to search for the innocence. They are only searching for guilt and telegraphing intentions, it shows that you are only looking for information to support the guilt that you are already assuming is the case. Have you contacted Gian Gameshi for an interview yet? No. Will you be? At some point of the investigation, he will be invited to come in and speak to us. At some point in the investigation, you mean after you have taken all of your statements from as many people as possible coming forward, claiming that they're victims, building a rock solid case based solely on statements, because remember, these are historical allegations. These did not happen yesterday or the week before. These are historical. They've happened years ago. These allegations. Anyway, so at some point you plan to invite him in for an interview. Well, I think the other word you meant to say was, at some point we plan to arrest him, because that's what you're going to do. The only reason he is getting warning right now with your conference that he needs to hire a lawyer and he needs to be prepared for arrest is because he's a public figure. It's because Jesse Brown started all of the hysteria and Gian Gomeshi has been well aware of this impending scandal for months up to this point. 
it's not like in the movies or on TV shows where a suspect gets called in for questioning and then released and then the police take the statements that they have from the suspect and compare it to the statements that they have from the complainants and determine whether or not he should be arrested. It doesn't happen that way here in Canada, not in these types of investigations. In these types of investigations, the police work solely with tunnel vision with the complainants who they already view as victims, take all of their statements and build a case, work with the Crown, the Crown builds the case, and then they arrest him. If an assault happened many, many years ago, a sexual assault, how do police pursue that investigation? Well, that's what we do. Um, there's no statute of um, um, limitations, so we go back as, as far as um, it's deemed reported. Um, we go back, we look at the evidence on hand, and we go from there. We take every minute detail and we investigate it to the nth degree. To the nth degree. How do you intend to do that when these are historical allegations that go back years? What possible details can you have? You will be taking statements, words, stories from people who are claiming that they were abused sexually, physically, that they were violated. How can you investigate that to the nth degree? especially when you haven't even involved the accused in your investigation. We've already established that you are waiting to build your case and for the Crown to build their case before you even hear the other side of the story, before you even have evidence from both sides of the story to actually investigate to determine if a crime even happened. If a person wants to report to police, they need to contact us. If a person needs some services, um, they need to contact us. Um, like I said, um, the Toronto Police is not just about coming forward, uh, reporting to us and then a criminal, criminal proceeding. We are very in tune with um, managing our victims and giving them the needs that they have. It's all about the victim and moving them forward. It's all about the victim and moving them forward. You provide victim services and they have to come to you if they need services. You are not all about just criminal proceedings, but yet this is all about the victim. Here you are again telling people that they have to come to the police. Re remember, if this was just a recent actual assault that has just happened, a brutal violent attack that has just happened to women, then you are doing the right thing by letting people know that they should come to you. However, they would already know that, um, or they would go to a hospital first and then be directed to you if needed. But we also spend billions of dollars on women's shelters and other services just for women. So I'm sure that it'll be easy to find a place to go to for help for a woman that actually needs assistance because there are so many services out there. They do not have to go to the police, but yet you encourage them to come to the police because, well, you and the Crown really do want a criminal proceeding to come out of a complaint. Hence why we are in this mess in the first place. Remember, you reached out to the complainants through the media, through the people that published media allegations of abuse. You reached out to them and had them contact you as if they didn't already know that the police existed. What kind of evidence do you need in order to lay charges in a case like this? Well, we need evidence of, um, if it's a claim of sexual assault um, under the criminal code, you need evidence of the sexual assault, that there is a sexual assault, an assault with sexual overtones. If there's an uh, overtone, sorry, if there's an assault, um, we need evidence of either a physical attack or a verbal attack. It's, it's defined in the criminal code. The question was, what kind of evidence do you need in order to lay charges in a case like this? Because by now, everyone's clued in that in a case like this, a case like this is very special. So, she refers to the criminal code and stumbles over her answer um, and basically says that what the evidence that they need is defined in the criminal code. 
So here we are looking at the criminal code, section 265, definition of assault, which also covers sexual assault. So a person commits an assault when A, without the consent of another person, he applies force intentionally to that other person directly or indirectly. Well, that's pretty broad, pretty vague, isn't it? That also equals sexual assault level one which is the most common incident recording by st recorded by StatsCan out of the three levels of sexual assault. Sexual assault level one is the least defined and most vague uh, crime that um, seems to be the easiest to charge somebody with. As we can see right here, there's really not much that defines it. Um, okay, so then B, the next level, he attempts or threatens by an act or gesture to apply force to another person. If he has or causes that other person to believe on reasonable grounds that he has present ability to affect his purpose, or causes that other person to believe on reasonable grounds. Okay, so all that person has to do is believe that force was applied to them even though there is no physical evidence. Interesting. Very subjective, I would say. And C, while openly wearing or carrying a weapon or an imitation thereof, he accosts or impedes another person or begs. Okay, this one is a little more straightforward. This one has a little more definition to it than the previous ones. Now let's take a notice here, there's also the pronoun he is used throughout this criminal code definition. There is no reference to she or a gender neutral reference, i.e. person. It is all he. So apparently this crime only applies to men. Men can only commit this crime. That's pretty interesting. Okay, so now we have the criminal code definitions of sexual assault. Um, I had to hack these because they are not very well organized on the web page, so I had to dig each one up individually and screen cap it. So, the first level, 271, is, as you can see, a very brief description. Everyone who commits a sexual assault is guilty of, and then it goes on to describe the nature, the, uh, the punishment, the type of offense, the type of punishment you would get. So, basically, there is no definition of sexual assault in 271 level, level 1, which equates with uh, um, section A of 165, the criminal code for assault. Not much of a definition, very, very broad, very vague. So if you ever see a definition of 271 sexual assault level 1 anywhere on the internet, it is always the result of an interpretive exercise by a researcher writing a report based on statistics. Just an FYI there. Okay, next level, 272, sexual assault level 2. Um, there's much more description to this here, and it does involve bodily harm. So there's more description here, which is good. Um, and 273, same thing. It's pretty straightforward what that is. Now, going back to the first level, um, again, uh, sexual assault level one and assault level one, those are the most common charges of assault in our system. And they are the most commonly tried and the most commonly convicted, I would say, out of um, all of these. I can dig those stats up too, um, and I will probably do that, actually. Ta-da, here they are, stat can sex offense statistics. So, as you can see here, as I was mentioning, sexual assault level one has the most amount of incidents. Now, keep in mind what I had just described earlier, what the definition of sexual assault level one is. Basically, a person only has to believe that force was put upon them, that they were forced to have sex or forced to accept a touch or forced to listen to a verbal assault. So here you see um, a pattern of approximately 20,000 complaints to the police for sexual assault level one. And then actual charges that come out of them drop significantly. 
So this tells us that there are a lot of people who are taking advantage of our criminal code system and also the police put a lot of effort into getting people to come forward to make such claims as well as all the um, women's services, victim services that we pay billions of dollars for scattered all around the country that encourage people to go to the police and press charges telling them a story. They have no evidence. Sexual assault level one does not require any forensic proof. No, no proof of any kind that anything happened. All they have to do is make a statement and say something happened. As you can see, the other more severe and more defined levels of sexual assault, level two and level three, have very low incident rates. That tells us that we do not live in a rape culture. Okay, so in our next chart here, we see cases completed in adult criminal court. Now from the last chart we just saw, um, level one sexual assault comprised of 7,600 persons charged. I believe that includes youth charges. So this table we're look looking at now is adult court, so it does not include any youth charges. Um, but I would, uh, I would surmise though that the youth charges are still um, low compared to adults. Don't have that data handy at the moment. So let's, let's look at these numbers here, and I'm going to look at the 2013-2014 column to the right, and it shows about 6,500 people actually uh, complete a case in court for sex offense charges. And as we know, most of them are sexual assault level one, the charge where the accuser only has to believe that harm was done to them. There does not have to be any forensic evidence. All you need is a statement. Okay, so of those 6,500 cases, as we see in the chart below, the guilty verdicts, half of them are guilty verdicts. So what this tells us is a, not only do the defense have uh, good, good attorneys, but also we have a variety of judges sitting on the bench. And we have judges that will scrutinize the evidence and conclude that there just isn't enough to prove that a crime actually happened, and they will acquit the accused. Then we have other judges who may be biased with a bit of a feminist twist and um, assume that this woman is sitting here telling me in tears this, this, this terrible story of sexual assault from X amount of years ago by this person. Not showing me any proof, but damn, she tells a good story. She's more believable. She's more credible. She's more reliable. And well, I don't like the way the accused looks. He just looks guilty. And all the stuff that the, the crown, all the dirt that the crown dug up on him makes him look even more guilty. So she will find a guilty verdict. This happens. I've seen it. <laughs> and then, of course, there are situations where there may actually be compelling evidence that proves guilt by, uh, that proves the, the accused is guilty. So, of course, we want those cases to result in uh, guilty verdicts. Nonetheless, these statistics are very interesting and it shows how arbitrary the system is when it comes to con convicting people on level one sexual assault charges. It's very concerning and I, I believe people really need to speak out more about it. How do you come up with that evidence? Well, victim statements, um, a lot of things, when somebody comes forward, there's a lot of information that comes forward and we pick out each piece from those statements. So, um, corroborating evidence, other witnesses, um, similar fact evidence from other victims. Um, there's a lot of different things to look at to link different things together. So again, the question is, how do you come up with that evidence to charge, to charge the accused? Well, she says corroboration. First thing she says, however, corroboration is not required, as we see here. In the Criminal Code, Section 274, corrobor corroboration not required if an accused is charged with an offense under sections, and you see all of the numbers, they are all sex offenses. 
the ones we were talking about earlier, 271, 272, and 273. Those are sexual assault. So in those instances, corroboration is not needed. So technically, the police do not have to have corroborating evidence. It's helpful, but they don't need it. They don't need it in order to pass the case on to the Crown. The Crown does not need corroborating evidence to build her case. So when she says similar fact evidence and statements from other people, she's still saying all they need are statements. All they're going to do is collect a bunch of statements from people, pick pieces apart, and, and build a story. <laughs> That's all they can do in these cases, particularly of a historical nature, which in this particular case, they are historical allegations. So again, she proves that all they need are victim statements in order to build a case against a man and have his life ruined. When it comes to physical violence, it's, uh, what does the law say on that? Can it ever be consensual? It can be consensual, um, not to an extreme. You have to have the ability to consent. Someone who's in intoxicated cannot consent. Someone who doesn't have the mental capacity consent to consent can't consent. Two consenting adults to um, conduct an abusive relationship, um, you can consent. Okay, so her comment here is pretty straightforward because in the criminal code, this area is actually well defined. Um, you can have an abusive relationship with consent. Okay, so in this case, it's BDSM, bondage and discipline, sadism and masochism. The only question here is, was there ever at any point a uh, non-consensual non point of this type of relationship with any of his uh, complainants? What kind of um, sexual assault evidence are you looking for other than the victim's statements? Well, again, like I said, there's many pieces to a puzzle. There's corroborating evidence. There's, you know, depending on time periods when these things happen, there's DNA evidence. There's witness evidence. Um, there's many different things to look at. Um, there's similar fact evidence that can tie different things together. Um, evidence of places that corroborate other victims' um, uh, comments. There's, there's a lot of evidence, uh, minute details that actually tie a case together. Oh, damn it, she asked me that question. What kind of evidence do you need other than victim statements? Oh, she looks so stumped and annoyed by that question. She gives the same answer, corroboration. Corroboration is not required, so that's bullshit. That only helps the case. That doesn't, is not a requirement in order to charge someone with, the, with a sexual assault charge. Similar fact evidence, you mean the same statements from other women. That's what you're going to be looking for. You're going to be looking for women to give the same statements. The best way for them to do that is for them to have a chance to collude with each other. Yes, that is how you get your similar fact evidence, isn't it? Can you talk to us again about what made you start looking into this? The chief said on Thursday there was no formal investigation, but you said you started once the media reports were out. Can you give us a sense of the timeline? Because we know that there was an investigation started by a newspaper in the springtime. Right. It, it, there was a flurry of media activity this week, and it, it came to my attention as I started reading it and realizing that there's these allegations that haven't been made to us about assault and sexual assault that I felt that it would be better for us to get ahead of it and, and see exactly what's coming, coming together so that if, in fact, a victim does come forward, we actually have evidence prior to that so that uh, we can be more proactive in the investigation and actually now as because we've done that we're able to move seamlessly into the next step. So this sounds like a little bit of careful tippy-toeing around the fact that you actually reached out to the complainants through the people who published the articles about their stories and asked them to contact you to come to you to report and receive victim services if that is what they wanted to do. It seems to me like perhaps you were receiving some pressure from the outside, definitely from the Ontario Ombudsman when he posted that tweet, 
um, to the Toronto Police Board services demanding that uh, they force you to take action to do something. So apparently the Toronto Police is susceptible to pressure and influence from the outside to get ahead of a situation, to be proactive in a situation when nobody has yet come to them with any official complaints to make uh, police charges, you actually are uh, forcing the situation. You have forced the situation, but yet here you're just saying that, oh, we were just trying to get ahead of it and being proactive after all the media reports that we read. Um, we believe victims when they come in 100%, we are behind them 100%. Our... Whoa. You believe your victims 100% when they come in. So they haven't even presented any proof. They've just sat down and told you a story and you believe them 100%. They told their story to a media publication. You read them and believe them 100%. You believe everything that the media tells you 100%. You believe the victims 100% means your investigation will absolutely not be impartial or unbiased. No investigative body can claim to believe one side of the story 100%. That is purely unethical. That is wrong. That means your evidence will be influenced. That means the information that comes from your complainants is influenced. This is what goes into our courts. This is what the public purse pays for when the Crown prosecutes people based on statements only, when the police put a case together based on statements only. This is wrong, and people need to put an end to this. So these, these people have come forward. Um, you know, they've seen that other people are talking about it, and it's brought it back up into their lives, and it's, they've obviously gone through it in their minds on, should I report, should I not report, should I discuss this? So uh, the one very positive thing about this with the media is you brought it to the forefront. You've got conversations ongoing right through universities, um, in all different uh, venues. Um, it's brought to the forefront, which is excellent. Excellent. Why exactly? It created hysteria around something that statistically is not a problem in our culture, but yet it created hysteria among other venues, the media, universities, the internet. It definitely created hysteria and uh, people are definitely talking about it and it's created even it's created so much paranoia, it's created so much division amongst people, it's created so much unnecessary fear, it's, it's fueled the feminist agenda, it's, it, it's made men want to withdraw even more from dating women if they haven't already found somebody that they trust. This is not good for the public. This might good, be good for you, Toronto Police Services, because you know, you look like you're doing something for the greater good when really all you're doing is you're supporting a man's life to be ruined by accusations that most likely cannot be substantiated by any proof. The fact that their stories, um, as you mentioned, they're cooperated, um, the fact that their, their stories have similarities, how crucial is that to you in terms of believing their allegations? Oh no, we believe them right from the, the onset. Um, there's never uh, a doubt about believing them. And again here, there's never a doubt about believing them. As soon as they walk in, that's it. They're telling the truth as soon as they open their mouth. Has it ever occurred to you that people make false allegations? You must know that this happens. You must know this. Please tell me you know this. Please tell me you know this. I can't understand this, but this, this is what our society has come to. This is what our society has come to. And the man has no chance, period. As soon as an allegation is made, it is truth, it is gospel, it becomes a charge. They just need more time to build an elaborate story, ask all their leading questions, 
get as many victims as they can to come forward to create a pattern of behavior. Case in point, this Toronto doctor was arrested just two days before the uh, Gian Gomeshi investigation started back in October of 2014. This man is a doctor and one of his patients laid a sexual assault and harassment charge against him. She claimed inappropriate touching. Now, um, keep in mind that the police always believe their victims and they investigate with their victims before they actually arrest the man and lay charges on him. And note in this, uh, in this article, the area I've highlighted, police say there they may be more victims. Now they only assume this because he's a doctor, so he has patients. What they don't say in this article is that he's an obstetrician, gynecologist. They do not mention that in this article. Turns out this doctor is very well respected in the community. Note his uh, page on Rate MDs. He has 92 reviews, most of which are positive, and they're all written reviews. And I clipped out a sample of uh, reviews that were written for him um, right after he was arrested in 2014. And as you can see here, he has patients that have been seeing him for years. They've delivered multiple babies uh, with him and they they are in shock and disbelief of the allegations and they claim to stand by him no matter what and then one year later the charges are withdrawn by the crown now note uh, the uh, statement here from his attorney the doctor's attorney says the allegations against his client likely arose from an unfortunate misapprehension apprehension of the care received. Now, the Crown withdrew the charges apparently before it got to trial. We can assume, I don't know the details. Nonetheless, um, this raises the question. The unfortunate misapprehension of the care received should have been investigated by the police. You would assume that the police are going to investigate her claim, keeping in mind the defense approach. To conduct a proper investigation, you need to think like the man is innocent. You need to look for evidence that would support his defense or his innocence. At the same time, look for evidence that supports the accuser's story. But obviously, the police are telling us right here, Miss Brevin here is just clearly saying that we believe our victims. Therefore, they will only investigate her claim and they will only investigate anything that backs up her claim. What statistics do you go by that give you the, a reason to give every woman that comes in with a complaint the benefit of the doubt without any doubt? What statistics support the fact that all women tell the truth when they come in to make an allegation against a man in terms of sexual assault? What statistics do you go by? The one in four, the one in three, the one in two? I don't know, because none of those exist. Who comes in and trains you on handling these types of allegations? What is your motive for believing everybody? Is this, is this part of the campaign of um, in, encouraging victims of sexual assault to go to the police? People who've been raped legitimately in the park, in the alleyway, wherever, they are going to deal with it. They are going to find a way to deal with it, whatever works for them. They're, they're not going to hide under a rock and just disappear. They are going to go deal with it one way or another, whether it's with their family, friends, the hospital, or the police. They will deal with it if it's a legitimate situation. When you're dealing with historical allegations, there is just so much room for falsity. There's just so much room for manipulation of the system. There's so much room for vengeance being taken out on the accused. And the fact that you facilitate this, and that you encourage this, and that you embrace this is absolutely disgusting. Right now you're interviewing, gathering evidence, and then kind of how it could lay out from here. Right, so again, the victim has to contact us to report. We don't, um, we don't reach out and demand a victim report. 
So the victim contacts us, an officer goes and speaks with them and gets the information and gives them their options. You might not demand a person report, but you will ask a person to report through a third person. I don't really know what the difference is here. If the only difference is demand versus ask, well, then you're still reaching out to the victim. How frustrating is it frustrating with it for police to be uh, seeing all these stories in the media and, and not have a complaint and not be able to move forward with the investigation? You know, I don't think it was frustrating. I think it was, um, it was an opportunity um, for it to be brought to the forefront in our society. What kind of society are we when we're more concerned about the feelings of women who are looking back on encounters with a man years ago, realizing now that it, 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 it was a criminal act that should be prosecuted? What kind of society are we when everybody takes the side of these women making allegations in the media, tarnishing a man's reputation, and nobody stands up for the man. Nobody even gives equal opportunity for each side to tell their story. And everybody just gangs up on the man. And every, everybody gangs up on the police. And everybody demands that the police do something and be proactive and get ahead of it. Before what exactly? This man apparently is not a danger to society, otherwise he would have been reported long ago. And the way that our community gathered around it and, and they, had, they were disgusted by it and knew that something had to be done, it allowed the victims, alleged victims, to come forward and get their story out. Um, and then they, I think perhaps the way that the community reacted allowed them to feel more confident to come forward to us. Yes, the community performed this thing called public persecution. And you are obviously supporting this. You have no issues with this. You uh, give the full benefit of the doubt to the accusers in the media. And the public was disgusted by these allegations. Did it ever occur to you that yes, there is a portion of the public that were absolutely disgusted by this, but not the way in which you think. People like me were disgusted by the fact that a man who was being publicly persecuted was on his way to being criminally prosecuted. And that, to me, is disgusting. Because it is so obvious that these women gained the confidence to come forward to report, partially because you asked them to, and also because they realized, oh, the police can take my potentially false allegation seriously, and I can get the attention that I want, I can get the criminal injury compensation money that will help me greatly, and I can ruin a man's life, and how great that's going to make me feel. These people are friggin' psychopathic, and you coddle these people and the public purse pays for the continued prosecution of these people and that is what is disgusting to people like me.